joining us today for the Advancing a Sustainable Recovery Through Private Markets discussion. Uh, I'm Sarah Williamson, the CEO of FCLT Global. And FCLT Global's mission is to focus capital on the long term to support a long term sustainable and prosperous economy. We're a nonprofit organization whose members are leading companies and investors worldwide that develops actual research and tools to drive value creation for savers and communities. So today we're talking about how to advance a sustainable recovery and particularly through the private markets and what role the private markets can play in this effort. So we know that private markets are an important source of capital that can drive a sustainable economic recovery. The private market has grown at a faster pace than the public markets in the past decade and is on track to continue that growth. With its growing capital base, employment footprint, and broad influence, the private market also represents a significant opportunity to make gains on our sustainability agenda. Private investors have meaningful ownership positions with a great ability to set the agenda at their portfolio companies much greater than public companies do, about public company investors do. Investments in illiquid private market space provide private markets investors with the ability to take a long-term orientation. So as the global economy recovers from the COVID-19 crisis, the par private market is well-placed to play a significant role in allocating capital, driving company behavior, and pushing for a net zero transition. So to talk about this challenge, let me welcome the panelists that we have with us today. First is John Graham, President and Chief Executive Officer of CPP Investments, Q Song Lee, Chief Executive Officer of the Carlisle Group, Josh Lerner, the Jacob H. Schiff Professor of Investment Banking at the Harvard Business School, and Stephanie von Friedenberg, Senior Vice President at the IFC. So thank you all for joining today. So before we get into the discussion, let me remind you all that this discussion is on the record um, and will be made available online after the session. All right, so let's jump in with this then. John, let me start with you. Uh, private markets, as we said, are slated to continue to grow over the next several years and continue to play a role in driving forward a sustainable economic recovery. How are you thinking about sustainability in the private markets versus the public markets? Great, thank you, Sarah. And uh, thank you for the, for the invitation to participate in the, in the panel and talk about the, the private markets and the role of private markets in, in sustainability. And I think certainly at CPP Investments, we do believe that some of the most compelling and some of the most interesting investment opportunities over the next decade are really going to be investing in companies that innovate and transition in the, the world's path to, to net zero. And this is a comp complex problem. It's going to require a very complex solution. And regardless of whether that is public markets or, or, or private markets, the capital and the way we think about it is the capital in this space, it's going to need to be patient capital. It's going to need to be long-term capital. And it's going to need to be partnership-driven capital um, because these are not solutions that we can put in place uh, overnight. And there may be some perception and maybe some per perception I've heard it anecdotally that the private markets may be a little bit behind the public markets in integrating ESG into the investment decisions. I think the one thing that I would challenge on that is the in the private markets, obviously the one thing we don't have is liquidity. And you can't divest, you can't just sell. And in the private markets, not only do you have the opportunity, but you have to roll up your sleeves and actually engage. And overlay in the private markets, the governance structure. Overlay in the private markets, the ability to have board representation, the ability to have influence strategy the ability to influence the, the C-level executives, and it provides a greater opportunity for influence, greater opportunity for influence at times in the, in the private markets and to support the companies, the companies that we invest in, the companies that, that other people on the panel invest in and support them from a defensive perspective as they look at their existing operations, think about how to improve their existing operations, decarbonize their existing operations, and also from an offensive perspective to think about how to find new opportunities and to continue to, to grow these um, businesses. 
And Sarah, you talked about the scale in the in the private markets and the scale we have today. I think about the the investment opportunity and think about the transition. You know, the, we've gone through a digital transformation over the past few years, where you have a lot of asset-like businesses that have transitioned. Now we're going through a transition of a lot of physical assets, and these physical assets will require trillions of dollars to decarbonize. And so we, again, I'll come back to what I said at the beginning. We look at the private markets as an area where we're see some very compelling investment opportunities and very compelling investment opportunities as the world decarbonizes. That makes a lot of sense. And you talked about um, partnership capital and that that term of partnership capital. So Stephanie, maybe I could ask you, what what's the role of government and public partnerships? Is is that a is that a similar idea that uh, that partnership capital can can play to ensure that the private markets continue to grow as well as ensure that there's capital that is needed for the sustainability agenda. And tell us a little bit of how that works, particularly with um, the emerging in the emerging markets. Sarah, first, thanks for the opportunity to be on, on the panel. Good conversation and, you know, sustainability is at the heart of what IFC has done since it was founded 65 years ago. Um, and when I look at the world, uh, we can't, no one can do it alone. You know, even pre-COVID, there was limited fiscal space. So to come out of the crisis, green, resilient, and inclusive, we need to bring the private sector along with us. And I think the MDVs are really, really well suited to do that. Um, we actually follow in the World Bank Group something that we call the cascade, which is really to say, okay, there are projects that can be funded completely by the private sector, let the private sector do them. When the private sector can't do it alone, let an IFC balance sheet, which is largely driven by private investment, step in. If that doesn't work, use a public-private partnership. And in the worst case, go to public money when it's necessary. Uh, but when I look at it, you know, at the situation in emerging markets today, I think there are really four things that we need to focus on to, to jumpstart the economy. You know, coming out of the 2008-2009 crisis, it took us about four years to get investment in emerging markets back to where it was. When I look at the magnitude of the COVID crisis, it's going to take us 10 if we can't jumpstart. So the first thing we need, public partnerships around policy and regulation. We need to incent private sector-led growth, and that private sector-led growth needs to be sustainable. Second, we need projects to invest in. What I see is in the private markets in particular, a competition and a race to the bottom over a handful of projects where there aren't enough for all of us to be investing in. So we need to take philanthropic money. We need to take foundation money. I noticed today that the Gates Catalyst Fund um, got some foundation money from Larry Fink. Really interesting idea how we partner that together, begin to build pipelines of sustainable projects. Then you do need blended finance and, and capital to de-risk. So you need first loss and some of these other things, especially in the poorest countries where the risk reward trade-off isn't always apparent to many um, of the investors as they move forward. And then finally, you, we need to create platforms that we can bring institutional investors on. We know that asset allocators have different criteria um, for investing in private markets, and they really are looking for rated investments or pools of um, equivalent rated investments. So our MCPP platform and other ideas like that um, that would give them access, again, to a pipeline of projects which would give them a pool of triple B or better assets is the next thing that we need to be thinking about. So it seems like you think that the, the, the bottleneck, if you will, is the one of the biggest one is, is the supply of high quality projects in, in, in the right places. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. Well, Q, turning to you, um, you lead one of the largest private equity firms in the world with investments in many, many uh, portfolio companies. Um, how do you think that the private market ownership structure that we've talked about a little bit already has helped your companies through major disruptions like COVID um, and um, how it can help be positioned for a sustainable uh, future to, to capitalize on some of the things that, that Stephanie's mentioned, for example? Sure. Uh, and Sarah, thanks for, thanks for having me on, on such an important topic. Um, look, the private markets, I think, are really well suited for these types of issues. We're very long-term oriented. We have access to um, a lot of capital. Uh, we have the expertise. Um, but really, we also have the governance model. 
which is we have real influence or real control with our companies. And when you put all of that together, it is a very, um, uh, it positions the private markets very well to deal with these types of issues, which by definition are, are going to take a long time. Um, and then I, I, I would say the final thing I would throw in there is the mindset. Uh, the mindset of the private markets and most private organizations is to one, to go create opportunity and find opportunities and then look for ways to adapt, evolve, uh, and to push forward. Um, and you're seeing this in technologies, you're seeing this in healthcare, but there's no reason why you're not seeing this in, in, in climate and sustainability efforts as well. And so I do think the markets are, are uh, the private markets are very well positioned. Uh, I would note, uh, and John mentioned this, uh, there's this energy transition going on, but I don't think folks have really uh, focused on the word transition as much as trying to get to a, a net zero target. This is going to take a long time. And uh, you just have to read the newspapers about what's happening in energy prices and how it's affecting the consumer in, in Europe and Germany, et cetera, and, and winter hasn't even shown up yet. And this is going to take a long time. And folks are talking about divesting when really... I think we should be talking about investing. We need to invest in companies and new technologies to enable alternative forms of energy to, to really take hold and the whole ecosystem around that. But, but really, just as importantly, we actually have to invest into the traditional and carbon-based companies because in order to wind that capacity down in a very responsible way, you need to invest to bring their carbon footprint down. You need to take capital and help these companies invest in expertise and help them transform over a, a broad, uh, over a very long time frame. So it's about the right um, long-term orientation. It's about understanding that there is a transition involved. We need to apply expertise uh, to the situation and really rather than investing and in uh, divesting, I'm sorry, and thinking that the problem will solve itself, we actually all working together have to invest properly to enable this transition to occur the right way. Okay, that's really helpful. Well, Josh, let me turn to you because um, Q's mentioned the governance in the private markets. And um, can you talk a little bit about the governance structures and how they have enabled either an agile response in times of crisis or to this transition point could be part of the solution in terms of transitioning over a period of time? Is that easier to do in the private markets with the private governance structure than the public markets? It's a great question, and thanks, Sarah, for, for it and for the chance to be here. Um, I think what we can certainly say is that the private capital model seems to really work during these times of discontinuity, the times of crisis. And, you know, for instance, um, when my colleague Shai Bernstein and uh, Filippo Melisani, uh, we looked very carefully at the global financial crisis and its impact in the UK. The nice thing about the UK is that private companies have to disclose a lot of information on their uh, income statements and balance sheets. You can really see what's going on. And what was very striking is that the private equity-backed firms relative to their peers not only reacted much more quickly in terms of realizing that something was happening. So for instance, uh, you know, pushing aggressively on drawing down their receivables and so forth in response to crisis. But then in the years to come, they got considerably more investments in the form of bank loans and equity investments relative to peers. Now, of course, the amount of inflows from banks and equity fell relative to what it was in 07, but it fell considerably less than it did for the non-private equity peers. And if you took the moving forward a few more years, what you saw is that those private equity-backed companies were able to invest more and ultimately gain market share, presumably as a result of not being as capital constrained and being more agile during the crisis than their non-private equity back years. So in many ways that it really underscored, you know, some of the advantages that private equity can bring, uh, bring to the table. Now, I guess when it comes to the broader question of saying, is does private equity have the same kind of advantage when it comes to the energy transition? It's a really interesting question. I mean, one of the 
uh, things that probably brought out the best in private equity in GFC was it was so immediate and you know just was sort of hitting people over the head to say we've got to do something right now. Clearly, this is you know while it's certainly happening, unfortunately, a lot quicker than I think most of us expected and hoped for. The the kinds of pressures we're seeing today are clearly ones that are not something about next week or next year, but over a number of years. And it's interesting to think about to what extent, you know, some of the real strengths of private equity will rise to the challenge in this context. So the, do, and do you think that the um, ability to react to a crisis, to use your example in the, in the UK, um, was about having the, the governance in place before the crisis hit, or was it about the incentives that were in place such that if they responded well, that there would be some upside there. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's really interesting, right? We talked to a number of the uh, both private equity backed and non-private equity backed CEOs of the operating companies tried to say, was this really a case of the carrot or the stick, right? What, you know, to what extent was it the private equity groups telling you what to do something and how much of it was more the, the, the mentorship or guidance kind of thing. And I think the, the answer seemed to be it's a little bit of both, right? But certainly an important part of it was just simply getting, you know, by early 08, a number of the CEOs mentioned their, their private equity managers were saying something really real is going on right now in a way that many of their peers just simply didn't seem to uh, didn't seem to recognize the magnitude of what was about to take place, what was already happening, what was like about to take place. Right. Well, John, if I come back to you, I know CPP has investments in both private and public, um, and uh, sometimes the the lines between those are are blurring. Um, how do you respond to, to to what Josh was saying about the governance and the incentives and? How do you think about the challenges of, you know, the public and private markets competing competing with each other in different ways than perhaps they used to, particularly as we try to think about this um, sustainability agenda going forward? Yeah, and maybe before jumping to the the blurring, maybe I'll just comment in, on something that, that that Q mentioned and also Josh mentioned, and um, with this energy transition. And as, as, as Q mentioned, it's more than an energy transition, it's an economy transition. The whole economy needs to transition. And we talk about operating in a crisis and op, you know, or reacting to a crisis, but it's also operating in a crisis. And some of the benefits has been highlighted on the private markets is, is the ability to have the governance and the, and the influence and the control at times to actually operate. And uh, with sustainability, there, there's very much a, a crisis mentality and, and, and people approaching it as a crisis and, and moving forward with it. With respect to the blurring between the public and the private, and as, as an organization that, uh, as you mentioned, invests in both the, the public and the private, and that is something that we're seeing a blurring over the past um, few years, and, and SPACs have continued to contribute to the, to the blurring. And you know, maybe just one observation or one area where, where we've seen it is, is really trying to get some of the early stage growth technology. And some of the some of the growth technology, especially in uh, sustainability, in agriculture, in the circular economy, and we're seeing these companies need access to to capital, and but are probably still at a stage where historically they wouldn't have IPO'd, um, but the the SPACs have allowed and facilitated some of them to to, to get into the public markets earlier than they that they have in the past. Um, so what does this mean with respect to the, the blurring of the, the, the public and the private? Um, I think one of the things we're seeing is probably more volatility actually at times within some of the public markets. And there's a scarcity in the with some of these companies and some of these companies that have new technologies, um, which is impacting the, the valuations of some of these companies in the in the in the public markets. Okay, so let's let's turn a little bit to this disclosure point. I think Josh, you raised this a bit about the fact that in the UK, actually, private companies disclose a lot, so you could actually do academic work on them. That is not the case in most parts of the world. So, um, Stephanie, if I come back to you, um, is it important for us to get 
sustainability disclosures from the private market? Is it, you know, is it is it okay for uh, us to have a lot more transparency in the public market, or is is there a is there some sort of carrot to to use John's word for the private market companies to, to be more um, t transparent in terms of their sustainability disclosures? Sarah, as we come out of the crisis and we really think about building back, as I said earlier, green, resiliently, and inclusively, we do have to look to emerging markets. And we know that the public markets in most of the, our countries of operations aren't deep enough to fund what's necessary um, to build a future economy, I, I think is, is what a few of the other panelists have said. Um, and in the poorest countries, they're really crowded out by govern, government issuances. So your choice is private markets. Um, add to that the fact that if we get this wrong in emerging and developing countries, that's where more than the majority of greenhouse gas emissions growth is going to come in the next decade. So we really need to figure out how do we get it right. I think the MDBs and IFC in particular aren't a bad place to start. We do have performance standards, and those performance standards drive transparency in all that we do. They've been adopted through the equator principles by 197 banks around the world. So again, another place to start when we think about um, private markets. I don't think that's enough. And uh, I think we need to go back to uh, what I said in the beginning, which is one policy and regulation. And, and here, I think further um, regulation around disclosure is super important and reporting would help considerably, whether or not it was public or private. And certainly in emerging markets, we're driving our government clients to be thinking about that. Um, second, and there's been a couple of comments about technologies. In order for us to really get this right in the private markets, we need to take those emerging technologies, some of which are proven, but the cost curves haven't come down. Others are completely unproven. If we can actually get to a point where we can have some first loss money and some blending to drive those costs down, we can start to have impact. And I think about, um, again, mirroring people's commitments to net zero. So six of the largest banks in the United States have committed to net zero. They don't have any idea how to get there and how to bring their clients there. Carbon credits might be a place to start and using some of that carbon credit funding as first loss in those structures in emerging markets may be a really interesting solution. Um, and then finally, as I said before, we need projects, projects, projects to be investing in and we need to get them developed because we're not going to get to net zero if we can't figure out how to create those projects, you know, in the world's poorest country. So let me ask you a, bit, a little bit more about the, the carbon credits. Are you thinking about those in a private market way, or are you thinking about those in a more public market carbon credit mindset? Is there are, is there a tie between the projects and the carbon credits in the private markets and emerging markets? Is there a way to make that happen? What I'm thinking, yeah. And I, I'm actually thinking that they probably don't become a tradable instrument. That in fact, what it becomes, I mean, in essence today, um, what net zero means for the big institutions that have committed to it is in a way a, a carbon tax. How do they get there? We need to figure out. But if we can marry that that tax, if you will, with what we need to actually create the right kinds of projects in emerging markets to prevent um, the further growth of GHG emissions and to pull coal out of some of the, the markets where otherwise we won't be able to, it's a really interesting idea. So, Q, let me come back to you. You, met, you mentioned this idea of investing in new technologies that that may lead to a greener world, as well as investing in sort of you know brown companies that are that are trying to get there, that are in the, in the transition. Do you think that there's um, uh, what it, what is the driver? Is it trying to get to net zero, and therefore you get into this sort of transition carbon credit mindset? Is it um, is it coming at it from the other way, which is, you know, changing the technology, moving it from a more economic view? What, what's the target? Is it something like net zero or is it really transitioning um, to, a, to a different business model? Yeah, I think that it's a really good question, Sarah, in the sense that I think um, lots of folks think about this from a, a very technical or a metric driven lens. And I like to think about this much more culturally. And I think what is really important is, you know, and this is what we're trying to do at Carlisle, and we've been working at it, is embed the notion that driving companies to be better companies, be it on the diversity front, be it better governance, 
be it driving better sustainability practices, improving your supply chains, you know, re, uh, uh, recreating uh, your, 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 uh, the inputs and in your formulations for your products to, to be more green, that, that doing all that actually drives better performance. It makes these companies better, it drives better performance, and hence it's that virtuous circle where um, you're not only doing great for the environment, but you're actually making your companies perform better uh, and driving for all stakeholders, right? And so, so it's, I think it's a cultural mindset attitude that you can't just do at a portfolio level. Uh, it, it's got to be very granular at each company, working with them, partnering with them to, with a mindset that we're going to make you a better company. And then the last ingredient for us is to create alignment, and so what we've done in lots of companies is put in, for instance, uh, credit facilities where uh, cost of capital goes down if you reduce your water usage or where um, cost of capital goes down from, from the banks if you reduce your carbon footprint, right? So, um, you know, it's, it, there's no silver bullets. You got to do a ton of different things. But I think it starts with the fact that it needs to be very ingrained in the investment ethos of your organization that, that you need to uh, drive all of this very culturally to, to, to attain uh, the aspiration, you know, to shoot for the aspiration that we're trying to make our companies better, they can perform better, you get better outcomes, and it all becomes uh, a virtuous circle. Makes sense. Josh, you said you might want to jump in here to tell me what, uh, do you have a reaction to what Q just said? Well, I just wanted to underscore one point that this is not just a game about divestment, that there's a lot more going on here in terms of strategy. There was a fascinating paper recently done by my colleague, Lauren Cohn, where he looked at the most important patents related to clean tech that have been developed over the last 25 years. And one of the things that was so striking is how many of them were created by, you know, by dirty companies, you know, who would normally be sort of seen as targets for investment. Yet they by far were creating the most and the most impactful of these investments. So it's really much, I mean, I think I just wanted to echo the point that rather than thinking it through lens of saying, let's just not invest in X, Y, and Z, it's more about how can we work with people who have assets to bring the economy to the next level. Great. All right. So, so Josh, I'm going to ask you to, to uh, give us the bear case, though. We've talked a lot here about what a good impact private markets can have, um, how they can really drive sustainability. But what are some factors that might hold the private markets back? You know, what, what, what is, uh, what's going to get in the way of this vision? Well, I think if you would ask me this question right before the pandemic, I think there would have been a very clear answer, which would be, uh, returns and the relative performance of private private markets versus public markets. And, you know, we had done some, uh, you know, small work with State Street and uh, Bain and Company, which they featured in their uh, 2020 report, which has sort of highlighted how, you know, when you compared, you know, private equity returns, which nominally looked quite good, but when you compared them net to the public markets, which had also done very well, it seemed that you weren't, you know, that what initially had been a huge private equity advantage in the 80s and 90s seemed to, in the, you know, particularly in the decade after the GFC, to just sort of dwindle away. And there just really wasn't much pri private capital advantage. And given the sort of complexity of choosing managers and managing portfolios and the like, it was natural to wonder whether at some point that would sort of trigger, uh, you know, a process of disillusionment on the part of asset owners, whether they would emulate, you know, CPPIB and try to do more stuff in the house to avoid the, the fees or whether it would just mean you know, going to replicating public market strategies and so forth. You know, one doesn't know. Now, when you look at what's happened in the last you know, 18 months, it's clearly been a much more um, favorable picture for private capital relative to the public market. So it seems that you know, not, perhaps not surprisingly, you know, private markets have really done well in a situation where there's a lot of 
uh, uncertainty and instability and where the kind of judgment that's required is, needs to be there. But I guess if we're, if we really think that hope and hope, we're going back to, you know, normal, you know, I guess that that question around what is going to be the private capital advantage and how much extra oomph are you going to get? And will asset owners, you know, continue to see this as something that is indeed, you know, worth the cost in terms of illiquidity and complexity relative to this putting market in public indexes or whatnot. Mm -hmm. But it sounds so it sounds like what you're you, obviously the numbers of the last year or so have, you know, it's all endpoint dependent, right? But the, many of those many of the things that have blown those numbers out have been new companies, tech companies, um, and so on. Obviously, different there are different parts of the private market spectrum. Do you think that that's just the, you know, normal sort of you know, migration, there's, there's a good return here, there's a good return there, um, and, and that your 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 trend line is is broken? Or do you think that this is sort of, you know, that the trend is still there because there's so much more competition in the private markets and, and we've got a blip here? I'm asking you to, to, uh, to uh, predict the future. I know. I mean, it, it is, we just did an update on our, uh, on our, our, our case on the Yale endowment. We were able to finish right before David Swenson passed away. And, um, you know, what was so striking is you look at the 2011 version of the case, and their annual returns for venture capital were on the order of 1%. And yet they, they not only stuck with venture, but doubled down on it. And clearly you look at things from the perspective of the end of the 2020 fiscal year, right? And it's, you know, close to 30% returns, you know, over a decade. And, you know, clearly this is a business which has, you know, very good years and very lean years. It's slightly biblical in that in that sense. But I think it is an open question as to to what extent this represents just simply business as usual, where you have some good years and some bad years, or whether the you know the the sort of broader trend, the moving average is sort of indicative of some you know, whether due to competition or something else, just there being less of a private capital event. All right, well, John, let me come back to you on, on this one, which is, as you think about this sort of private public and where there are real opportunities, both from sort of a, a pure return point of view, but also from the point of view of um, advancing a sustainability agenda, can you tell us some of the things that, that you're most excited about? Is it the cool little tech companies? Is it the investing in the, the brown companies that want to be green? You know, how do you, where do you, where do you have the most interest these days? It, it's probably all of it, but um, the, uh, I'd say that um, and, and building on some of the, 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 the previous uh, comments that, you know, we do really see this as an economy transition. We do really see this as opportunities across the, the entire economy and in more traditional industrial companies. And to Stephanie's comments on emerging markets, we have, you know, for an institutional investor, we've been quite active in emerging markets and continue to be quite active in emerging markets. And um, you know, because of our concentration in emerging markets, it does, you know, we do see a carbon intensity in the portfolio, but part of it is actually investing in companies that are transitioning and investing in, in infrastructure projects in different emerging markets uh, around the world. Speaking more broadly, where we see the opportunities, and also coming back to Josh's comment on divestment, you know, we've been very clear that that we're not going to pursue a path of, of divestment. We're going to pursue a path of engagement. We're going to pursue a path of partnership um, with companies, and this includes investing across the entire energy spectrum. And we personally see a lot of you know engineering and scientific know-how in uh, in some of the more traditional energy companies and kind of viewed divestment as a in many ways a short on human ingenuity that is coming out of these companies and we have one example in our portfolio a company that we seeded a few years ago that's a midstream company in western canada that was a traditional midstream company called wolf midstream and they're now the developer and operator of one of the largest carbon capture and utilization storage pipelines in canada if not the largest and it's really that engineering know-how they have that they were able to apply to this, to this new technology. So we're continuing to look for these opportunities, continuing to look for where we see the engineering, the scientific know-how that can be applied to these problems. Um, so it, that's it, it's kind of all of it, and it's across the entire, entire spectrum because we do see this as an economy transition. So Q, let me come back to you. You also look across a number of different things, whether it might be 
you know, early stage, later stage, infrastructure, so on. What, where, what are you, um, what are you most excited about when it comes to both the the um, the return opportunities and the opportunities to uh, to, to push sustainability? Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, similar to John's answer, I, I I think what's happened over the past several years, uh, COVID has accelerated it, but the whole digital uh, revolution, but also now the focus on climate, these are orthogonal changes that are affecting every single industry, you know, across the board throughout the economy, to John's good point. And so I'm actually seeing, we're seeing an unleashing of opportunities, big companies, small companies, mature incumbents that are embracing digital in order to uh, uh, improve uh, their operations. We're seeing, you know, young upstarts and and disruptors and, and growth companies. And, you know, we have a platform that allows us to pivot to, to see the best of both. And and, I, and I'm and i very um, long-term pretty darn bullish about the fact that um, the opportunities are uh, up and down the spectrum. But the other axis I'd throw in, and Stephanie has been pushing on this, is we see this globally. Um, it's in India, uh, it's in China, uh, it's in you know parts of Southeast Asia, it's in Latin America, you know, across the world, you're seeing uh, these types of, of, of opportunities because it's, it's, like I said, it's an unleashing of, a, of an orthogonal disruption. Um, and we have to also come to grips that different countries are at different stages uh, with respect to transition. We can't uh, assume that certain countries are just going to be able to flip a switch and, and, and do it overnight. I mean, we, we can't here. Um, and so we're going to, it's going to take a lot of, uh, um, a, a very multicultural appreciation um, um, to 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 navigate through, which is why um, you know we see great opportunities in Europe, whether it's Flunder and you know uh, turbines uh, for 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 wind, or whether it's in uh, it's in America uh, with with some of the growth companies we're seeing, or whether it's you know manufacturing companies in apparel. Uh, where we're trying to reduce their 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 water usage while improving their profitability and their growth. So it's it's a it's multidimensional, Sarah. It's it's big companies, small companies, old technologies, new technologies, uh, and it's also around the world because of the, the nature of the the, the disruption and, and the changes that are occurring. Yeah, that disruption is everywhere. We had. Um... Mark Carney on a podcast recently, and you may know he's written a book, but one of the things he quipped in there was, you know, he, nobody said, here comes the smartphone, there goes the taxi business. And so I think it's, uh, the, the question is, you know, here comes climate change, there goes what business? What is it that we're not thinking of? Stephanie, is there, can you pick um, opportunities? Is, is it is it like choosing among your children to talk about which, uh, you know, emerging market? Maybe you can't, but are there great is there opportunities that you could really point to from a, uh, from a positive point of view in, in any of the markets you operate in in particular? Well, so Sarah, opportunities abound. Um, and see, everybody's right, it's a global challenge and we can't um, let go of emerging markets. But, you know, I'd start with what you said about, you know, no one saw the smartphone coming. I think about the disruptors in Silicon Valley who look at sectors and say, okay, how do I disrupt this sector? And then they build a technology platform. We need to do the same thing with development challenges and technology. So what are the really hard development challenges and how do we apply technology to do that? And quite frankly, I think there's going to be substantive investment and, and money to be made where we do well and do good um, in technology. And I look at you know hard industries to correct for, like manufacturing, heavy industries. How do we make clean steel? How do we make clean cement? Um, there's going to be technologies that are going to be invented if they haven't already. Uh, what we need in emerging markets, though, um, is some kind of de-risking and blended finance to drive those cost curves down. It's exactly what we saw with mobile. You know, mobile started as a luxury item in the developed world and ended up, you know, in the poorest countries of the world creating connectivity. The same thing happened with solar panels. It took us 10 years to get to a point where solar was cheap enough for every country in the world to be able to use. What I'd like to do is figure out how can we move more rapidly with those different kinds of technologies to drive them into emerging markets faster, because we will, again, do well and do good. So how do we drive more of those projects that you're interested in that can do well and do good? What can the, you know, if you could speak to these big, you know, private investors who, who are on the uh, screen today, what, what can, what sparks those projects that then leads to the ability to, Put money behind it, and 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 uh, then then tackle some of those challenges you mentioned. 
So I actually think all of the investors who are on the call with us today will come into those projects if the projects exist. I think the question is, how do we create those projects? And this is where we need to marry philanthropy uh, and public money, donor money, to actually generate the right policy and regulation and then the projects themselves, because Q and John are sitting on capital. And they'll go after those projects if if we can stack them up properly. And you know, there's there's clearly a role for IFC to play in 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 getting many of those off the taxi rank. And you know, we do invest across the capital stack and and can do lots of interesting things um, with John, with Q, and and with others. Uh, but we really need to spend time focusing on building those project pipelines first because they're not there now. Well, well, maybe Josh can help by getting the uh, students at HBS to to push on the push on those for those two. So, uh, Josh, any thoughts on um, opportunities that you see that are exciting for you as you as you look at either emerging markets, private markets, other places? What what's what do you find most interesting? Well, I mean, it's certainly hard not to be fascinated by what is really happening with the the fusion of technologies today, right? And you know, on the one side, you know, you've certainly seen, you know, existing technologies being adopted into many traditional verticals and so forth. But for me, the big question still remains, you know, that venture is amazingly good at transforming, you know, at starting new businesses in the IT area in probably 25 cities in the world, most of which seem to be in the U.S. and, uh, and, in, and in China. And the question that I find really most fascinating is, is there a way to sort of have some of the creativity and governance associated with the venture process and have it sort of diffuse out more, more generally into areas like clean tech, advanced materials, and so forth? I mean, certainly there's been, you know, many efforts over the years to try to do investments in those areas. Some of them have worked, but by and large, it just hasn't been quite as exciting as IT in terms of returns, and there's when you look over the long haul of the venture industry, it seems that a lot of the money has gone into IT areas and it's been fabulously successful. But there's a huge amount of other technologies that would certainly benefit from the governance and finance there. So, how do we take some of the things that we've talked about today in terms of governance and incentives and and so on, and really apply them even more um, to the to the clean tech space? Well, I'm looking at our clock and we are, uh, it's about time for us to wrap up. So, you know, if I could, if I could try to summarize, it sounds to me like there's a huge opportunity for private markets, both in terms of pushing the transition and brown assets that are greening, uh, funding potential new technologies, whether it's clean tech or other sorts of things using that governance structure and incentive structure um, to align um, interest towards different goals, maybe changing cultures a little bit to try to um, uh, capture those goals, and really thinking about this um, in all countries, from the, you know, from the U.S. and other wealthy countries all the way down to the ones that are um, really in need of these um, exciting projects to, to, to get things off the ground. Um, so with that, um, I think what we're going to do at this point is that we're going to thank everybody who has been on the line with us, and we are going to transition to um, a Chatham House discussion um, with the pot, with the top link participants. So with that, I'm going to thank each of you very much in the order that you're on my screen. Josh, thank you. Stephanie, John, Q, thank you so much for your insight today and for all the work that you're doing in trying to really marry this idea of putting the force and the advantages of the private markets together with um, this idea of advancing a sustainability agenda. 